Hello, everyone. If everyone can hear me, if you can just say OK in the comments, that'd be helpful. So I'm not talking to myself. OK, OK, great. Thanks, Kinsley. Thanks, Belinda. Cool. So I'm on two computers here, I've got my main screen here, and I've got the side laptop as well, so I've, I can keep an eye on comments um, as well. Uh, thanks guys for joining us. Um, such uh, great that we can have all these online meetups and still um, get together in, in some sort of way, which is great. Uh, tonight's topic is gonna be um, getting clients and uh, client relationships, uh, specifically uh, where things go badly with your client relationships. I just want to I guess some thanks to a few people first. Um, so we want to give thanks to um, WP Engine um, for helping us out um, with our uh, physical meetups. So once they, they start going again, um, we're going to hear a lot more um, from those guys as well um, and lots of other sponsors as well. So we're going to create a sponsor page um, and we'll share that stuff out um, on, on the YouTube channel for that. But just want to thank all of our sponsors for, for really helping us out over the year. And hopefully once this virus gets over, we'll all get to, to hang out together and eat pizza, which should be, which should be good. Um, so tonight, uh, we've got a JetBrains um, special voucher. So we're doing that one again, and that's for developers. Uh, so JetBrains, they develop some of the, the IDEs uh, for programming IDEs. So if you're a developer joining with us tonight and want a free copy of, a free year's copy of PHP Storm or um, some JavaScript IDE, then in the comments, um, just add, um, uh, I love brains, or I want brains, I want brains, and then we'll search the comments and we'll do a live draw afterwards and we'll send you a, a voucher uh, for that. Um, so I've got the, the hosts up here for tonight. Just a, a little uh, short introduction. Uh, so my name is, is Will Brown. I'm one of the organizers for the WordPress Sydney Meetup and WordCamp Sydney as well. Uh, I am a developer, back-end developer, uh, but more recently I've moved into WordPress consultancy. So I've got a few uh, companies. I've got Zero Point Development, which is my, my website uh, consultancy business, and I've got a company called WP Wingman, which looks after WordPress site care. I've also got two other businesses, adventures, that I'm spinning up very soon, so um, I'll probably just try and um, hold off just now, but maybe talk, chat about those next time. Uh, the other organizer um, here is uh, James. I'm going to flip over to James if you want to do a quick intro, James. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, my name's James. I'm also a meetup organizer and web camp organizer um, for um, the Sydney meetup and the Parramatta meetup, which, I mean, there's no location for meetups now, is there? It's all online. <laughs> um, but I'll be at both um, when we go back. Um, I run... Um, a company called Creative Compass. We do marketing um, and WordPress websites and SEO um, and various other business things as well. Um, I recently started a business called Custom Puzzles. I'm going to make some puzzles, um, get some puzzles printed, you know, it'll be fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, it. that's about it for me. And we have our lovely presenter here, Brooke McCarthy. Brooke, do you want to just give a little introduction um, to let people know who you are? Sure, love to. Uh, thank you for having me. It's great to uh, to see you again. I was just saying to James earlier, last time I saw him was on the dance floor at that um, <laughs> funny uni bar on Broadway at the WordCamp, the last Sydney WordCamp um, so I'm a digital marketing trainer and a business coach. I've been self-employed for 12 years now, which makes me happily unemployable. Uh, and I've got 15 years experience in digital uh, marketing. So I'm more from the communications end than the coding and developer end. I cannot code. Please don't hold that against me. Uh, and in fact, I employ um, website designers to create client websites. So I get the business and then I uh, subcontract the business out to website designers that I've been working with for a number of years. So yeah. Great, thanks for that. Um, we're gonna do a little bit different stuff here today. So we're gonna shake up the agenda um, a little bit. Uh, James suggested that we each bring a, a WordPress news 
topic and just kind of discuss that and see see what your guys' uh, reactions are, um, all the people who are watching. <laughs> FFF Rook, she, he wants brains. That's good. Okay. All right. Um, my topic for tonight is one from WP Tavern, and I'll copy that down in the comments here. Um, so there was an article in WP Tavern just a few days ago um, talking about WordPress dash icons. And for those of you who don't know what the dash icons are, they're little icon sets um, when you're inside the WordPress dashboard. So for posts and pages and for the media library. So all the icons down the left-hand side of the admin, um, they're in a, a font called uh, dash icons. And um, the author of the post, Sarah, Sarah Gooding, from WP Tavern, um, yeah, she basically dropped in on one of the, the WordPress core meetups and discovered that they are actually going to be um, discontinuing the development of, of the Dash icons um, in favor of a, a new concept. So the reason that they're getting rid of Dash icons is they say it's, it's too big. It's a whole big icon set. And the more that they add to icons, the bigger the set gets. And you can imagine every time you load WordPress and you do a refresh, it's having to load this, this dash icon block. It's like a big sprite block um, in all the time. So I think at the moment, it's up to something like 100 odd icons. Um, so they've decided um, whenever re soon that they're going to stop project on dash icons and they're going to spin up something called the new icon component. So they're going to scrap this whole idea of a font based icon and they're going to go for SVGs. So if those of you who don't know what SVG is, um, it's a, a vector graphic, which means it's just a little block of code, tiny little block of code in text, and that describes and it tells the browser how to render an icon. And because it's just a small block of code and not pixels, it means it can be scaled um, without any pixelation. And because it's so small, it can be rendered and transferred from the browser super quickly. Um, so yeah, go and have a look at the the article, read the article. Um, I'd be interested to see what, what your guys' thoughts on that. I think it's a great idea. Um, and I I'm really looking forward to seeing um, people in WordPress core really pick apart the admin for those little things. Because I think that can make a huge performance um, update. Rather than load a big block of icons in all the time, you just load in specific icons that you need. Um, so there's probably going to be, um, I think there's a GitHub repository with the, the plugin in there for that. So you can download and have a look at the, the early alpha for that. Um, and yeah, so definitely, um, I think that's a, a great little article um, that Sarah picked up on. Uh, go and have a read. And uh, yes, let me think what you guys um, think about it in the comments below. I think that's kind of funny because you can't upload SVGs to a WordPress media library without a plugin. <laughs> well, that, that might change. Maybe, <laughs> probably not though. <laughs> <laughs> James, do you want to um, discuss so your? I, I brought a few. Um, and I'm going to touch on a few lightly rather than go into detail with one. Um, and first one was different events that are going on at the moment. Um, it was announced that WordCamp Europe was changed to an online event, um, and still for the same date, the fourth, fourth to the sixth of June. But it's a free online event now, um, which is really cool. I was going to go to, um, it was in Portugal. I was looking forward to going to the beach um, and, and going to WordCamp, but you know, that's not going to happen now. Um, so, yeah, they've got an online event and it's free for anyone to join. They've got business topics, um, developer topics, design topics. Um, so, that's really exciting. There's another one that's on actually right now. It started on the 27th of the, and it finishes on the 1st of May. Um, it's called the WP feedback virtual summit and that's also free um, and it's on right now um, i haven't checked it out yet but i've heard it on social that it's pretty cool um there was another one as well which i didn't look too much into but it's apparently called wp block talk have you heard of that one yet? no no i've not heard of that one uh, apparently it's like a there was like a summit where they it was all about wp blocks um for the new editor um, and that's that's now posted to WordPress.tv. So I, I might check that one out after. OK, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, so the other thing was the Word, WordPress version 5.4 was released uh, two weeks ago, a week ago. Um, yeah. Remember? 
Um, and that's got some new block features. Um, have, you, have you checked them out yet? Really? I've updated all my clients' versions, but I haven't actually checked out what's what's on core yet. So, yeah, and not as if I don't have any time on my hands, but I just seem to be really, really busy just now. <laughs> do stuff with um, gradients and backgrounds and buttons and stuff and social icons. So that's pretty cool. You know, I haven't checked it out yet either. I've, I've updated every site, but I haven't looked into it. Um, uh, WooCommerce version four was also released um, two weeks. Three weeks ago now, um, and that's got some really cool new stuff with um, a JavaScript powered dashboard. So you can go and see, you know, there's a new customer view where um, before it was just like a standard kind of WordPress you know, WordPress users table, but now they've got an interactive one, which is awesome. And a lot of analytics and reports and stuff for that pretty cool. Um, and then the last one I found is this cool block. You know, you know when you're connected, when you're using Chrome and you disconnect from the internet, it comes up with a little T-Rex game. Someone yep. let into a block. It's called Blockosaurus. <laughs> block Blocksaurus. Blockosaurus, yeah. <laughs> so that's really cool. <laughs> um, and you can you can drag it in and have like a the T-Rex game <laughs> on your site. That's just crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. Cool. Thanks for those updates. Uh, Brooke, have you got anything you'd like to share about what's happening in your world just now? Yeah, sure. So most of my clients, or all of my clients pretty much, 95% of my clients are small business owners. Uh, a lot of them run bricks and mortar businesses. And um, in the last five to six weeks, they have been scrambling to move um, a lot of their business online. So because I'm a business coach and a trainer, I fielded 253,000 questions on how to use Zoom, how to use Loom, how to get a membership <laughs> site up quickly, uh, you know, how do, I, how do I kind of deliver the services that I used to deliver face-to-face uh, -face in an online environment. Um, I've also had um, a lot of work from businesses who have pivoted quickly. So, um, for example, and they've come in the most unlikely places. So, for example, I had a face-to-face -face, uh, custom training job that was happening tomorrow and mm -hmm. um, the client emailed me and said, oh, look, um, you know, because of COVID, COVID, blah de, blah um, we have to reschedule. And I said, oh, well, actually, I think now would be a perfect time for you to be training um, on, you know, how to do this, how to do that, you know, in a in a in an online environment, in a very different environment. Yeah. So that that email pitch, and it was, you know, it was a pretty short email pitch. That email pitch led to a uh, website. Uh, fixed job you know a small job on their website and then the owner of the company asked me to quote on the whole website redesign so there's definitely still business um, out there and you know I think if we if we stop panicking and we just kind of slow down a little um, and appreciate that you know jobs still need doing and especially on the internet you know everybody is on the internet <laughs> oftentimes you know like there's been so much going on uh, and, you know, one thing that I came across just today, actually, from the Canter uh, COVID-19 bar barometer report mm -hmm. was after the 2008 global financial crisis, the brands that continued to invest in marketing uh, throughout the crisis recovered nine times faster than the ones that didn't. I started my business 12 years ago in the middle of the global financial crisis. Yeah. Um, and you know, so I think I think if we can just appreciate that there is still work out there, and that we should keep marketing and we should keep pitching, um, and keep asking, then yeah, there's plenty plenty to go around. Yeah, that's great. I completely agree. In fact, uh, and so does so does Warren Buffett. Uh, he he says like now is the time. He said that in the GFC as well. He says yeah. now is the time to really invest. You know, invest mm -hmm. in your business. Um, make sure that you're on target for when everything goes goes back to well normal <laughs> if you can say uh, 
Well, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, I just got a big um, client job today from a new client, a new, I, I have had a meeting with them, but I hadn't gotten any paid work yet. And they've just uh, sent the contract over today. And they are putting together a massive digital marketing course. And they're, they're, they're um, fast forwarding it, you know, so they're, they're trying to get it happening as quickly as possible. So me and a bunch of other subject matter experts are all working on it at the same time. Awesome. Um, and I, I, yeah, I don't think that's an isolated incident. No, no, that's great. It's great how to see people are adapting in, in these times. Yeah. I've noticed hey. that as well. Mm. Yeah. I've been James, doing last week. there's a question for you, James, about 5-4. Um, if you also want to take that one quickly and then we'll, we'll jump into the main. Um, yeah, can you hear me okay now? It's better. Okay, yeah, my laptop keeps turning down the input volume for some reason. On its own. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, I posted the link as well in the in the um, YouTube comments to the word the WooCommerce for release notes. But there's some really cool stuff with customer dashboards, um, reports, analytics, and like you can filter down to like specific days for specific products. It's really cool. Very very powerful stuff. Okay. Much, cool. much needed. Okay, I think we're going to jump into the main presentation. Uh, Brooke, are you ready to go? I am. I am indeed. Okay. All right, let me just put yours on screen and let me get rid of our... Hello, can you hear me okay? Can you just give me a hi? I can hear you because I can no longer hear Will or James, so it would be great if the comments could say yay. Okay, awesome. I will kick off. So I want to talk about um, today when good clients go bad and also how to kind of uh, catch the Titanic before it sinks so that we can turn it around and hopefully um, have a good experience and a great outcome for all parties at the end of it. Uh, so before I kick off, I'm just going to talk about what we're covering is warning signs and red flags. Uh, and sometimes you need to get these tattooed on your head because I don't know about you, I'm pretty good at making the same mistake a number of times before I finally learn my lesson. Um, what to do in the midst of client crisis when the shits hit the fan minimizing your risk by having an awesome client onboarding process, uh, getting paid, always fun. <laughs> Who likes getting paid? Can I have a hallelujah if you like to be paid? Isn't it nice when it goes ping and you get that payment notification and you're like, yes, thank God. I know for a, a while there, that, that week in March when uh, coronavirus was just kind of everywhere, like on the news and everybody was panicking and nobody knew what was going on I had you know a few outstanding invoices and I was like oh, please please and and when they got paid um I was like oh thank god because you know you don't know if people are going to panic if clients are going to panic and if they're going to start being weird on you um and then finally the last thing I'm going to talk about is being future focused in your business and I think that last point is particularly useful and relevant to the here and now. So um, a little bit more about me so you can decide whether or not to pay attention or whether you could in fact, you know, go and do something else <laughs> because especially on the internet, it's easy to pretend you're here when actually you're cooking dinner or you're, you know, doing your taxes. I know I was, uh, my partner was doing his taxes all day today and I did bass yesterday. So that might be you, who knows? Um, so I'm Brooke McCarthy and I'm a digital marketing trainer and a business coach. Most of my clients are small business owners, not all of them, but most of them. Uh, and I've been gainfully self-employed for 12 years now. Um, 12 years ago, it was pretty different, the olden days of the internet. Um, and what I do nowadays, it's evolved quite a lot over the last 12 years, but what I do nowadays is I equip and empower business owners with the skills that they need to basically get their businesses out there um, to, to market themselves, to get more clients. Yay. Everyone wants that, right? Um, plan B is I have a cave house in Turkey. So my partner and I um, travelled 
for about a year after we met. We met in Cambodia. We ended up in Turkey. Um, and I accidentally kind of, well, not accidentally, but I on purpose bought a cave house, didn't quite think it through. Um, and yes, uh, ran out of money. So the money cleared my bank account fairly dry and uh, we had to come home. But I still have the cave house. And if the partner and the kids and the mortgage in the suburbs doesn't work out, then uh, makes me makes me happy to think that this is my plan B. Um, so a little bit about the business or the client relationship, rather. I think it's pretty much like a mutual admiration society when we first begin. And you know, tell me if you if you kind of agree with this or or if this is something that resonates. You, you kind of fall a little bit in love with the client's business, especially if they're in an industry that you're interested in, you're, you're already interested in. You, you know, all of a sudden you're learning a lot more about that industry, you're learning a lot more about their sector, about what they do and how they do it. Um, they're a little bit in love with you because you're techie and you're smart and you make stuff happen that they don't understand. <laughs> so, so everybody's happy. It's like this honeymoon period, yeah? Yeah. They think you are some kind of exotic genius because you know the internet. You know? <laughs> you know how to get stuff done. You know how to make magic happen on the internet. And, you know, there's something very seductive about that. And then, you know, all of a sudden things perhaps start off, they start kind of going a bit awry. Um, perhaps, you know, they're, they're a little bit of passive aggressiveness in the tone of their emails. Um, perhaps they're a little bit slow paying, you know, certain invoices uh, and, you know, all of a sudden um, things go wrong. Um, so it's, you know, it's part of my mission or what one thing that I really strongly feel is that, um, you know, we should share the things that go wrong in business because you don't learn from, <laughs> from you know, things going fabulously. You really learn, I think, where shit hits the fan and you're like, oh, my God, you know, how did, I, how did I get that so wrong? So I've made all the mistakes. Hopefully I can save you a few. Uh, and it can really be quite <laughs> painful when, of course, the escalation happens and things are getting really, really shaky. So after a while you might start to think, wow, I just need to restructure my business. Does this sound familiar? I just need to chuck out everything I'm doing and create a business where I don't have to talk to other people. Have you heard yourself say that before? Yeah? <laughs> have, you heard, have you heard other self-employed people say that? Because I've, I've had multiple different conversations and heard multiple self-employed friends, you know, normally at the bar around midnight say, oh, my God. Forget this, I just need to start again and I don't want to speak to other people. You know, I do not want to speak to other people. Yes, Michelle, that cave was Cappadocia. That's where my cave house is. Um, so warning signs. Let's get into the nitty-gritty detail. Um, they don't follow your procedure to book into your initial phone call. So what I used to do is I'd, I'd answer the phone to anyone, I'd uh, respond to any email, you know, the emails that said, hi, how much is this? And you're like, oh, uh, <laughs> nice to meet you too. Um, you know, and you start this kind of protracted, awkward conversation where you're going back and forth and back and forth and asking them questions and trying to, you know, trying to figure out what they want, what they need and, you know, how you can uh, put a proper quote together for them. So. If they don't follow your procedure, if you firstly don't have a procedure, well, it's hard for them to follow it. But if you have a procedure and that might include booking an initial phone call, perhaps through Acuity. I love Acuity scheduling. Um, perhaps I've got, there's some fans of Acuity here, I don't know. Um, Calendly is the other major player in the field. Maybe you have some other recommendations apart from Calendly and um, Acuity. Um, but they can fill out some form, they can fill out a form, they can book themselves in and when you go to talk to them, um, you're already armed with information. You've already asked some intelligent questions and you know, you know what to what you're dealing with here. 
Number two, they bitch about other service providers. Now, I've had this over and over again, and I listen carefully when um, people talk badly about other people. So if a client comes to me or a prospect comes to me and they're, um, they're bitching about the last job, the website that's a bit of a mess and the fact that they didn't get what they wanted and the guy was a, you know, a loony and da 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 then it's, it's a bit of a warning flag. Yes, they might have a point, but it's also a warning sign that they might actually just be a nightmare to work with or they might be one of those people. But number three, it's all mapped out in my head. Anyone had that experience before? Anyone had those clients before? Oh, I, I just cannot, I cannot talk, I cannot write it to you. I need to talk to you on the phone. I was talking to some dude on Facebook through my Facebook page the other day and he was insisted he needed to talk to me immediately to talk through an idea and I'm like, dude, if you cannot write it down, then, you know, please. Um, so it's all mapped out in my head is, you know, a big one. You've got to, the person has to be able to commit their thoughts onto, um, into words, into, you know, your form, into an email. They're too quick to commit. Now, that seems kind of a strange thing to say because, of course, we're all hoping, you know, praying that we get a client who, you know, wants to start yesterday and, and pays your deposit speedily and wants everything done, you know, in a, in a hurry and you're thinking this will be great. This will be wonderful. I'm going to make so much money because the job's just going to be quick and then I'm going to, it's going to go live and everything's going to be fabulous. But um, I've also found that this has been a warning sign, a big warning sign over the years. Um, and then number five is they are a victim with a sub-story. And I think that, you know, that is a perhaps it sounds a little bit mean to say <laughs> they're a victim with a sub-story. Um, but I think that you've got to be super careful here because, um, you know, it, it's, it's a warning flag that they are potentially emotionally manipulative, potentially an energy vampire, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. So if this is the case and after a number of years, you might consider giving it all up and getting a real job and you wouldn't be alone there. I hear this from clients all the time, from my small business clients all the time. They're like, Brooke, <laughs> I looked at job job ads today. Don't tell anyone, you know. And I think we all do that. We all have days where we're like, you know what? I just need to stack shelves at Woolworths. I just need to, you know, work at the local coffee shop. Everyone there looks like they're having such a good time. Um, you know, I don't want to do this anymore because I do not want to deal with clients. So you're not alone if you're thinking that James says, I'm doing that now. Yeah. Completely understandable. So the shit hits the fan. What are you going to do? How are you going to move from a client emergency into saving the day? Because my background is in public relations and one of the truisms of public relations is that, um, you know, something that starts off as a disaster has the potential to be turned into a big opportunity. Just because something looks like a complete emergency or a total catastrophe doesn't mean it's going to end that way for the business in question. So if you do a good job um, triaging a client emergency, you can emerge in a far stronger position, a much better position than when you started. So how do we do that? The first thing is we want to stop hiding from your clients. Now, we're all guilty of this yeah even me and I you know I profess to like people I'm a people person you know <laughs> I like meeting strangers I like talking on the phone um but you know even even I have days where I'm like I just don't want to talk to anyone and I certainly don't want to talk for, to my clients when the shit hits the fan that that feeling is you know amplified and the problem is that you're going to be emailing them back and forth and that just becomes a bigger problem you're making a bigger problem for yourself so if you are lucky, they'll tell you there's a problem. Most of the time they won't. If they do tell you there's a problem, that's a sign of respect. They respect you. They're demonstrating that they respect you enough to let you know that there's an issue and that they're asking for some kind of a resolution. So, so don't be afraid of that. You want to get on the phone as soon as possible. Do not do the back and forth, back and forth, back and forth emails. 
If it is, if you are a big company, it's not just you, if you are a bigger business, you want to change the team of whoever's working on the project. So whoever's dealing with the client on a face-to-face -face capacity, uh, you want to change that person. And you, the, you as the business owner needs to take responsibility. So you as the business owner needs to step in and go, right, you know, we're going to, here I am, I'm here to fix this, we're working together, we're going to fix this. Now, if it's a genuine emergency, I'm not talking about a client who's just a whinger, I'm not talking about a client who just wants to, you know, call you 20 times a day to talk through every, you know, single thought that they've got. <laughs> that, that is not a client emergency, that is just a pain in the ass who needs to be kind of coached on how to how to interact with you and you know how to expect it. Um, so at, when you've got a genuine client emergency and it's it is you that has done something wrong, it is your business that has done something wrong, or you know even if even if it isn't you your business that's done something wrong, you know you you impress upon a person, you impress upon the client when you stand up and say I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to wait for somebody else to take charge. I'm not going to wait for somebody else to take responsibility. There's a problem. I'm going to deal with it. So at this stage, you want to forget about your billable hours. Your reputation is worth far more, yeah, far more. So, you know, what I teach, part of what I teach people is that your reputation is a bankable asset. You know, this is why we do marketing. Um, so people want to be seen and heard. This is absolutely fundamental. This is a fundamental human, uh, you know, impulse. And oftentimes when somebody's complaining, and no doubt you guys have been on social media before, um, you know, a, a few weeks ago there was a bit of, there was a lot of mess on the um, Facebook pages of Kmart and Target and Woolworths, you know, customers jumping on there and complaining because this wasn't working, that wasn't working. And gee whiz, if e-commerce for major retailers, you know, ever had an opportunity to shine, it was, you know, four, four or five weeks ago and I think they'd failed pretty dismally, most of them, at that. And a lot of these people on social media, all they want to do is they want to be validated. They just want somebody to say, that's shit. I'm sorry to hear that that happened to you. You're not saying, I'm sorry, it's my responsibility. I'm sorry, I did something wrong. I'm sorry, I'm at fault. You're just saying, I'm sorry that your expectations weren't met. I'm sorry that you had an experience that wasn't fabulous. That's, you know, oftentimes that is enough, um, obviously, depending on the details, depending on the magnitude. So what do you say exactly? I'm sorry that you feel this way. I'm sorry that this experience hasn't lived up to your expectations. What I need from you is, and be super clear, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, can you do that? Another way of putting it is uh, what I propose is, because again, you're being proactive, you're demonstrating leadership, you're demonstrating initiative. Um, and then a really nice way of, you know, beginning and ending is let's turn this around. You know, let's do something about this. I'm not going to sit and wait and wait for somebody else to fix it. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to take responsibility. You know, I'm going to make something happen. So I really love this quote from Tim Ferriss, and I see this to be true in my work pretty much every day of the week. A person's success in life can usually be measured by the number of uncomfortable conversations he or she is willing to have. So nobody wants this to happen, <laughs> yeah, and um, especially if you're dealing with grief, if you're feeling uh, sad, if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling stressed, if you're feeling anxious anyway, and then, you know, you have a client emergency, of course you want to stay in bed, put the doona over your head and mainline some vodka and binge on Netflix. Yeah, that's a given. But if you can at that time pull yourself together and initiate that uncomfortable conversation knowing that the client's going to say something that's going to bruise your ego, that's going to be perhaps, you know, difficult for you to respond then that says a hell of a lot about your character and it says a hell of a lot about, you know, your likelihood for success. So 
Now let's kind of shift gears. I want to pivot a little. I want to shift gears and talk about how we can stop this thing, stop these problems arising in the first place. Now, what I used to do way back when, when I had my website on Joomla, God forbid, it was goddamn awful. I had it on Joomla uh, until I got hacked, of course, um, and then I moved to WordPress, um, never looked back, is I did not have any prices on my website. So I offered copywriting, I offered uh, email newsletters, I offered website design, I offered, um, you know, video images, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I listed all those services on the website, but I didn't have any indication of price. I didn't have any packages. I didn't have any kind of form apart from, you know, first name, email address, phone number, if you're lucky, comment. Um, I didn't have a smart website form. And then I build in arrears because I came from public relations. And I think this is oftentimes true of everybody really is we, we build our businesses based on our experience. So I came from public relations, so therefore I kind of modelled my business on public relations. And in public relations, you get uh, a, a small number of retainer clients. Ideally, you get retainer clients, you service them every month, you bill them at the end of the month. That's what I'd done before I started my business. So that's what I did when I started my business. I got a small number of retainer clients, um, I looked after them every month with um, marketing assets, with marketing pieces. I published, updated their websites. I wrote copy for their websites. Um, I put their newsletters together. I, you know, uploaded their videos onto YouTube um, and I build in arrears and I waited 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 to get paid. And what ha happened is some clients should change me. Um, one client sent me this email full of legalese and paid me some, you know, wacky, some kind of random amount. Actually, I think two clients did that. One client I took to the small claims court and won $2,000. I decided $2,000 was too much to lose. Um, but this, you know, it was always often the case that I was waiting to be paid. And my cash flow problems disappeared overnight when I decided people were either going to have to pay a 50% deposit um, before I would start or they would have to pay the entire amount up front in full. So overnight, um, my problems stopped. I also started putting prices up for certain things. So I started running courses, face-to-face -face courses in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide. I started putting the price on my website. I started offering business coaching. I put the price on my website and people paid and it wasn't a problem. So if you say something along the lines of starting with X with an average project fee of Y and more complex projects coming in at Z, give them some idea of what the pricing is going to be because, of course, we've all had that experience where somebody's turned up, you know, going, I'd like the $20,000 website, but I've only got 500 bucks. We've all had those experiences. They're frustrating for both parties. Um, Pre-qualified prospects with a smart website form. I'm, I'm super keen on asking smart questions. As a business coach, I think one of my skills is asking good questions. And when you put that on your website in forms, you are subtly educating people. You are subtly educating people on what to expect, what your process is, um, and what you expect from them. So it makes excellent sense, yeah, because nobody wants to waste time having endless coffee dates for the client with a $500 budget, yeah? Not fun, not fun. Um, you also want to state your process on your website. It, it saves everybody's time and it makes you look professional. Now, I've worked with numerous um, website uh, developers and designers over the years. Normally, I work with a website designer for two or three years before, you know, they move countries, their circumstances change, they, you know, they change their business, whatever. Um, but I've, I've, I've interacted with a lot of website designers and I've seen... Uh, people that have brilliant onboarding processes, brilliant forms, brilliant briefing forms, and others, you know, who, who are amazing at what they do. I work with a designer who, you know, her, her design was impeccable, but there was no process to anything. Everything was over email and it was like, 
so, you know, what are you thinking? And I'm like, what am I thinking? Geez, Louise, you know, where do I start? Um, you also want to make sure you've got a polished standard answer to the question how much. And I uh, talk about this a lot with clients because um, I don't, I think most of us, you know, I'm generalising here, so correct me if I'm wrong, but most of us grow up um, not talking about money. We're not comfortable talking about money. It's not normal in our families to be talking about money. It's quite rude. So when we're put on the spot by a client who says how much, you know, we kind of go, oh, and we, and we start go, going blah, 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 and waffling and, you know, not really winning their confidence. So um, you do not want to be talking money for the first time ever with a client. So what I do and what I coach my clients to do is to actually talk to yourself out loud, practice having money conversations, practice having sales conversations in the shower. Practice having sales conversations when you're in your garden. Practice having sales conversations when you're walking the dog. Do not wait until it really matters before you, you have those conversations. Now, the process of actually um, running the website design is you want to time bind your design process, yeah? So this is a best case scenario, yeah? This is a best case scenario in my eyes. You can take what you want from this and you might decide, okay, I'm going to take this bit, I'm going to take that bit, I'm not going to take the rest. But the idea of time binding the design process is that you're booking clients at least eight weeks out and the date is super clear to the client. Again, you can use Acuity Scheduling, you can use Calendly, and it, it sends automated emails saying, don't forget, don't forget, you know, so the client has absolutely no excuse for not remembering. Um, and if the client needs to reschedule the process, then they need to give adequate, and I'm talking about 14 to 21 days notice, because for this to work, properly you need to have quite a lot of work yeah you need to have everybody literally standing in a queue waiting to be seen by you and to do that you need to make sure that you are organized the next thing is to ensure your proposal includes your payment terms and a little bit about your process so normally if i'm quoting a website design i put a short process in the quotation so the way that I structure it is I, um, I have the first part of the, of the proposal which talks about the pain points. This is a sales process, right? We have to talk about the pain points. So I reiterate what I know that the clients told me. This is the problem. This is why you need a new website. This is what you've told me, the reasons why you need a new website. And then I segue into the best outcome so um, in the client's eye, so I say such and such business needs to position themselves as a thought leader in the such and such industry so that they can, you know, win more clients, da 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 da, -da. whatever it is. It's, it's a basic sales structure of problems, issues, worries and benefits and outcomes. Then I have um, all the inclusions in a list of bullet points. I've got the price. I've got the payment terms and conditions which is, you know, what I'm talking about now. And then I've got the process and it says, number one, this happens, number two, that happens, number three, that happens. It's not long, yeah, because I'm not a fan of massive long proposals. I know I've seen plenty of web proposals that are like 10 pages long. I don't think clients read them. So my proposals are, are short, but there might be, you know, eight or 10 numbers in this is the process. You fill out this form, then we do this, then we do that, da, 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 da. Uh, you need to um, be generous with templates. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I think one of the great um, issues that we have is trying to get information from clients. Is that true for you? You're waiting. You're waiting for images. You're waiting for copy. You're waiting for feedback. You're waiting. You're waiting. You're yeah, waiting. So how you can start to make this process a lot easier is you can start to give templates to people. Here is how you write your about page. Do, to do, to do, to do. Here is how you write your services. Here is why I need you to write, you know, five pages for your services rather than just bunging it on one page. You know, here is the best practices 
for laying out, you know, for, for including this information that's necessary. Uh, and you can you can do also you can also have online forms such as you know Google Forms for example where you're leading them through the information that you require. Oh my God, Belinda's just said one client I'm approaching two years waiting for coffee copy. I would send the final invoice and say see you later. Jeez Louise. Um, so the other thing, the final point with that is that you want to coach clients on how to be a good client. People don't necessarily know what you're expecting from them. So for example, I had a client that used to ring, he rung me 5.30 on a Friday. He did that twice, yeah? I didn't answer the first time, I didn't answer the second time. He stopped calling me. I had another client that was a chiropractor. He'd be at work on Saturday and he'd call me. Didn't answer the first time, didn't answer the second time, didn't answer the third time. He stopped calling me. So if you make it clear to people, and some people, they, you know, it's almost like uh, you need to train them like a puppy. <laughs> you need to repeatedly state, if you want to talk to me, click here. You can book into, you know, to do so on my acuity scheduling on my Calendly calendar, and we can talk. I need 24 hours notice at least, whatever it is. Um, okay, getting paid. Getting paid, offer a discount for payment in full upfront. So, you know, a lot of sales, a lot of effective sales is how we position things. And um, rather than saying, you know, here's the price, you could think about saying, okay, well, here's the price if you do a payment plan. Here's the price if you pay 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%. But if you pay in full upfront, we can give you a discount. Now, of course, you're working in your profit margin in both scenarios. You're not losing money or you're not losing profit. You've done your maths. You know that if they do pay in full upfront, you're still making a good profit on that, even with giving them a discount. Now, this is what I always do because I'm relying on, I'm taking money from clients and I'm paying my website designers and sometimes those website designers I've never met before. Sometimes they're in you know, Europe, for example. Um, you know, so I want to make sure that my costs are covered. I don't want to be out of pocket because I've been out of pocket before. I've had clients, you know, client relationships go uh, pear-shaped where I'm at a loss. I've paid the graphic designer, I've paid the website designer and I'm out of pocket. I'm not going to not pay the gra my graphic designer and my web designer. They've done a great job. Um, but, the, you know, it's not their fault that the client has gone renegade. So if you front load the payments, then your staffing costs are covered, sorry, your staffing costs are covered by their first payment. Yeah, so you're minimizing your risk. Um, you can also set up recurring monthly invoices through Zero. You could also do that through PayPal. Um, I do that all the time now. Uh, it just makes things easier. People are used to paying in installments, they're used to paying um, for Netflix, they're used to paying for Stan. We have ZipPay now, we have Afterpay. It's just the way of the future. It's what people are used to and it's only gonna continue. So why wouldn't you do it as well? Especially because it's automated. So you're not having to chase anyone, which can obviously feel a little bit awkward. You can also charge retainer bonds. So clients pay double the first month so that they're always ahead. So that is if they're paying the same amount every month, if you have them in some kind of retainer, uh, what you can do is you can you pay, you bill them to, to confirm the work for the first month and then when you actually start the work, you bill them straight away. And so they're always a month uh, ahead and then you don't have that awkward situation at the end of the relationship, perhaps where the love is lost, um, where you're a bit tired of each other's company, where, you know, you've sent them the final invoice and they take their sweet time paying it. So you're always ahead and you don't have to worry about that. Now, I cannot emphasise enough the importance of boundaries. If you guys are self-employed, you would know this already yeah it is so easy for us to work weekends it is so easy for us to work evenings and public holidays great i can get some work done without clients bothering me right uh, now it's super super important if you want to be in this for the long run if you want to be gainfully self-employed and most importantly if you want to be happy and not be a bitter jaded shell of a person 
uh, you know, in years to come, that you set proper boundaries. And every time you do so, an energy vampire loses a fang because the thing that I've found with, with difficult clients, with problematic clients, is it's not the bullies that are the problem because it's easy to spot a bully. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward to spot a bully. It's the charming people that are the most problematic because they charm you into doing all kinds of things and bending and twisting your terms and conditions and all of a sudden you're kind of looking back going, oh, my God, how did that go so terribly wrong? So what I'd really love to encourage you, this is my tagline for my business, is to make boldness your business strategy because if you're used to waiting to get paid, if you're used to being um, negotiated down, uh, if you're used to scope creep and clients kind of, you know, one thing I find super annoying and really common is that final payment. Have you guys had that as well? You've got the final payment due. The, the bloody website is on its, you know, 11th hour. You've got the final invoice and then the client's like, oh, we need a new page here and, oh, can you redo this bit? And, oh, you know that web navigation that I signed off on five weeks ago, well, it turns out that, you know, we want to redo it. You know? And they're kind of holding you hostage. So it's easy for us to be held hostage, yeah? It's easy for us to be held hostage. And it's much harder for us to make boldness our business strategies and to decide enough is enough. This is my business. I'm not trading, you know, employment and working for one boss to work for multiple bosses, every client becomes my boss to dictate, you know, dictate to me how they see things running. Um, but when you decide, okay, I've had enough, for God, I'm, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm going to stand up and, and I have a process. I have terms and conditions. This is how it's going to go. Oh, my God, how your life will change. Yeah, but you've got to make that decision. You must make that decision. No one's going to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, we'd like to pay in full up front. It ain't ever going to happen unless you ask for it. So if you can change your attitude, the kinds of things I'm thinking about is design your business for your best case scenario and then communicate this in your client's best interests. So case in point, I've always gotten um, commitment from clients for business coaching. There's plenty of business coaches that do single one-off sessions. Uh, and I get asked all the time, do you do a single one-off session? No, I don't do a single one-off session. If you want to do business coaching with me, you have to commit because it's in your best interests. Yeah, whatever, whatever you're doing in your business, whatever process, and especially if you're changing things and you've got existing clients and you don't want to lose them, you don't want to lose your existing clients when you raise your prices. You don't want to lose your existing clients when you change your process or terms and conditions. You need to state it in the client's best interest. You need to figure out how you can put that in the client's best interests. Do not negotiate your process. It will always come back to bite you. Your process sets you free and it ensures that what you put out is consistently excellent. How many people have gone, oh, no, I really shouldn't do this. Oh, go on, it'll be fine. I'll just do it anyway. And then you're like, shit. It, the shit's hit the fan. It's, it, it's, it's blown up in your face. So you do the best job when you do your best process. The other thing to appreciate is you need to be prepared to not get the job. Now, I've had clients come back to me and say, you're too expensive, we have another quote that's cheaper and I've gone on to win the job, yeah, because there is something I think um, very uh, confidence enhancing in the client when you don't, you don't sound desperate because clients I think sometimes can smell the desperation and when they can smell the desperation, they do not feel confident in you and that is not a good place to start a relationship. So you need to trust, yeah, we need to have a bit of faith here and especially in coronavirus times, we need to have a bit of faith and a bit of trust that, that you know, good clients are coming, that fabulous clients are coming, that there is plenty of work out there. So you are the boss. You need to act like the boss, yeah. You need to inspire confidence in other people because there's an old sales adage that is um, 
uh, what is it? Sales is the transfer of enthusiasm from the seller to the buyer. And there's got to be confidence in that. There's got to be confidence in that. So my challenge for you guys tonight is what is your best case scenario? Yeah, have you ever granted yourself the joyful experience of figuring out what a best case scenario is? Have you ever gotten out a pencil and dreamt up a best case scenario? Well, go ahead and do that. Now is as good a time as any. How can you get more comfortable with discomfort so you can have those difficult conversations? What is a non-negotiable? Write it out. Yeah, stick it to your wall. I put it on my wall where I can see it, where it's staring at me. If you need to get it tattooed on your head, get it tattooed on your head. How can you make your non-negotiables abundantly clear while expressing these from the perspective of being in your client's best interest? That's really important. And thank you very much. This is me, hustleandheart.com.au. You can also find me at Brooke McCarthy, Noe on Brooke.com. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Brooke. That was good. Glad. Yeah, I, I uh, took away some real, I mean, the whole thing was fantastic, but I took away three specific um, key points from your, your talk there. One was um, endless dates with clients who have a budget of less than 500. Yeah, been mm. there, done that. Been there, been there, yep. In fact, the, the first one I remember was uh, an accountant and he charged like three, $400 an hour. Yeah. And then af after, after paying for coffee and a croissant, told me I had a budget of $500. Oh, I'm nice. Like, Mate, that's not even like two hours of your time. <laughs> did he pay for the coffee and croissant or did you? He, he did. He paid for coffee and croissant. So oh. he must be in a generous mood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. The, the second nugget that I took away is practice sales talks in the shower. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of doing shower stuff. Uh, I'm always yeah. like, you know, because it's a time you're on your own, you're relaxing, it's time to get your head in, in the right space. So, yeah, I do things like that all the time. I think that's that's fantastic idea. I love that. And the last one was um, to charge retainer bonds like charge yeah. double on the first month. I think that's mm. that is really really good idea because that gets you ahead, mm -hmm. and it gives you that space that buffer. If they don't pay, to get onto that straight away, but knowing you've got that extra four weeks lead time, mm. yeah, you, know, you can start legal process or chat or something like that. So yeah, I think those are fantastic. Oh, good. Right. Um, there were there were some questions. Um, let's just see. I'll put them up. Can you see that? Yeah. So, yeah. So Steph said, um, what made you choose self-employed life and how did you get through the first few years? Um, this is, how did I, why did I choose? I, I think the honest answer, which is not the answer I give everybody, <laughs> is I had a hell job with a hell boss who managed me out of the position, which is, terribly painful it's like a slow fire firing <laughs> um, and I decided she she was actually thinking that I would leave her and become self-employed and she I should thank her because she gave me the impetus to get going I thought well she thinks I could do it I'm only I think I was 29 or 28 I thought I was too young and I thought well if she thinks I could do it I guess I could do it so, yeah, so the first few years, the first few years were pretty straightforward. I uh, got my first client pretty much straight away. Um, and one thing I did that I recommend everybody do, um, if you haven't done it already, it now is a great time. I sent an email to every single person I knew. I did a bulk email with my yahoo.com address. And I said, I'm starting a new business. I'm offering these particular services. And if you know anyone, I'm not saying give me money, I'm desperate for money. I said, if you know anyone who's looking for these particular things, then please put me in touch. Um, so that kept me going for about, I don't know, three or four years, really. I had, um, I had replaced my old PR salary um, by about month four. Yeah. Cool. Okay, we've got another question from Michelle. Uh, can you give a great onboard pro, uh, uh, give an example of great onboard processes and forms? Um, oh, look, I can't think of many off the top of my head. There is a great 
uh, copywriter in Adelaide or rather South Australia. Um, her name is Anna Butler. Um, her business is called Copy Break. She has some very impressive uh, forms um, and, yeah, and I'm, I've been lucky enough to cultivate relationships with a number of sm uh, small business owners and sole traders who, who are in effect competitors uh, and do similar things than I, that I do. And so, yeah, watching them and, and, and they've shared their forms with me and I'm just like, wow, that's, that's fabulous. I think, um, you know, you can probably go and check out a few different kind of uh, leaders in the field and see what, what, what questions they ask on their websites. I'm always a bit of a geek like that. I love a good form. <laughs> <laughs> One more? Yeah. I uh, love suggestions for Facebook Messenger where leads, clients make contact in Facebook Messenger and then they can see you online, therefore, and message you soon. Oh, my God. That sounds so painful, Belinda. Jeez Louise. Um, I, I do still have clients that do that to me. I do still have, because I, I um, have a large volume of clients, the nature of my business, my business model is, you know, I have hundreds of clients. Um, who do my training, who do my courses and coaching, um, and I interact with them on social media. So sometimes they send me private messages on Instagram, private messages on Facebook, and they ask me questions. That's <laughs> so really annoying. So um, I just say, can we take this conversation to email? Uh, you can definitely ignore. There's nothing stopping you from ignore. And, in, and indeed, you know, all this technology that we now have, I think that we need to um, we need to uh, take control and appreciate that we have choice. So if somebody um, calls me, I don't have to answer the phone. If somebody messages me, you know, in the evening or on the weekend, I don't have to respond. If somebody emails me on a weekend, I don't have to respond. Um, I, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong and everything right with keeping business hours uh, and just saying to clients, look, you know, my business hours are eight till four nine to five, I don't work Mondays um, <laughs> because I don't have to work Mondays, um, you know, and if you need to talk to me about anything, just click on this link and book yourself into my calendar. I, acuity scheduling is, I cannot sing its praises enough because I open up my calendar, you know, Tuesday afternoons, Thursday mornings, you know, Friday mornings, and people can access certain hours at those times and book themselves in for a chat. Um, and, again, you can use the form to lead them through the questions so you're not having these ridiculous conversations where they're saying, you know, how long is a piece of string? You're kind of directing their focus. I think that's great. That's spot on. And I wish if I would send myself back 10 years time, I wish I would tell myself to set up ca uh, calendar yeah. uh, and booking schedules because it just, it just automates everything. It makes you able to just to push it off to the side. Yeah. Um, Belinda, what, one thing I'd suggest is if you are getting lots of stuff through Facebook Messenger is maybe have a look at some of these um, bot chats, like mm -hmm. uh, ManyChat and BotStar. Yeah. Because yeah. you can do something similar to what Belinda said. You can set up, sorry, to what Brooke has said, you can set up um, automations. So somebody tries to message you or your, your business on Facebook and the bot takes over and asks them question. Are you looking for mm. development? Are you looking for to chat to Will, to chat to Brooke? And it leads them down to uh, endpoints where they can send a calendar link um, or mm. an acuity link or send you an email or just like put you off to the FAQ part of, of your website. Mm. Um, mm. So if you're quite keen on not just ignoring people on Messenger, maybe you could go down that route and put like an automated bot in that, that sucks up most of your 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 um your requests. What do you think about that, Brooke? Have you tried those? I have. I've got many chats set up. Um, I'm not great with many chat, but I have set up the initial questions, and um, I ask people what their favourite beetle is, John, Paul, George, <laughs> or Ringo, and whether they're a dog person or a cat person, and I get people responding. Uh, and weirdly enough, I never have cat clients. I always have dog clients. <laughs> so there you go. What a strange world. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's that's it for all the questions. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for your time, Brooke, um, giving that thank to you. us, going through the presentation. I think, I think managing clients is going to be difficult going ahead because you can't do that physical 
interaction. Hopefully that'll get a little bit better. But um, yeah, if people can take on board some of these these tips and put them in place, I think they can avo avoid a lot of the yeah. issues. And you know, this is actually a great opportunity, Will, to stop the goddamn coffee meetings and the face-to-face -face <laughs> meetings. You know, this is an opportunity to go right from now on. You know, everybody, I'm only doing phone meetings, and it's only happening through Acuity or Calendly. Uh, Acuity. Somebody asked A C U I T Y. dot com. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, that that's your time, right? And time yeah. is money. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, you're welcome to hang around, Brooke, but um, if you want to head off and get some dinner or something, then, yeah, feel yeah. feel free. Don't feel you have to hang around for the, the last part. Thank you. I might uh, grab some dinner, actually. Cool. Well, thank you again, and I uh, hope to touch base with you um, soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Will. Thanks, James. Thanks. Thanks. See you Bye. Bye. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> okay, let me just see if I can... Get this working. It was working a little bit ago, but it doesn't seem to. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. James, I'm going to get rid of you just now. Is that all right? No problem. See you at the end. He's gone. <laughs> yes, uh, Paul, yeah, the YouTube, um, it's been recorded on YouTube just now. Um, once the broadcast is finished, it takes a, a few minutes to process it, and then it'll be, it'll be ready, like, in about... 30 minutes or something so yeah that's great uh, so i wanted to give a little presentation um just on generally getting clients because i know a lot of a lot of people at the moment um you know they're they're at home uh, some businesses um have closed down some people are jobless um some other other companies are in hibernation mode so i just really wanted to give some ideas um to you guys about um, how to start lead generation. So I'm not gonna do a deep dive into all the topics, um, just enough to kind of get your, your gray matter thinking um, about the stuff. So let's, let's have a look. These are the topics we're gonna just briefly look at today. And again, this is all about the idea of um, getting you thinking about how you can adapt your business and get more leads co coming in and, and make, make more money. The first one we're going to look at today is target audience check. Now, this isn't really lead generation per se, but um, with people staying at home and businesses closed, some, uh, some in hibernation mode, as I said, um, are you 100% sure that the target market you identified BC before Corona, I love that, somebody, somebody said that to me this week, BC before Corona, are you sure that your target audience is the same now as it was before. So with everyone changing their processes, so people are, are changing the way they, they live, they're changing the way they buy, and they're changing the way they shop. So perhaps now is the time to think about how, um, how your business is targeting, who they're targeting right now. Is, is that the same? Are they doing the same things? Um, or do you need to adapt your business a little bit more um, to cater for the different way in, in which they're, they're, um, it, they're doing their lives. So I think every business um, needs to be looking at who they service and what their needs are in light of this virus uh, pandemic. Next one is, is update buyer personas. And that's kind of linked with, with the first one. Um, oh, Steph, you like that, that BC. Uh, there's another one, uh, AC, after Corona. So getting your business ready AC. Um, so buyer personas. Um, so if you do find that your target audience has changed a little bit um, in light of the virus pandemic or, or anything else, um, then it's probably a good idea now to go back to your um, per buyer personas and just to update them and to make sure they're relevant for how people are, are going about the business just now. Um, if you haven't heard of a buyer persona, um, they're fictional, generalized um, representations of your ideal customer. Um, they help you understand your customers and your prospective customers better, and they make it easier for you to tailor your content um, to their needs and their behaviors um, and concerns uh, for the different groups um, that are the buyer personas. The strongest buyer personas 
are backed up with uh, market research. So if you can pay to do market research, that's great, but not everyone else can do that. Um, so you have to really rely on um, asking asking your customers. Send them out surveys and ask for feedback. Just ask them what they do, where they go to, what chat rooms, what groups they're, they're a member of, and just get that research in, build up that information so that you know where your customers are and what habits they employ. And, and that'll uh, allow you to update a really, really good uh, buyer persona and really target specific uh, people. So buyer personas are, are really good. And I'm going to drop in the link, if I get this in the comments, uh, I've got this ready to go. I've got a Google document, a template for generating your buyer persona. I don't think it's mine. I think I probably stole it from somewhere else, but it is very simple. It's just a couple of pages. Um, have a look at it. Um, so it goes through things like age, um, um, social interests, um, and then it goes through like objections and what, what their goals are and things like that. So have a look at that. And if you've never done a, a buyer persona before, that's definitely a great document for to get you started. <clears throat> but as well as um, updating buyer personas, a lot of people miss out the other one, which is negative or exclusionary personas. So the, the buyer personas are people who want to buy your ideal um, product. Whereas negative and exclusionary uh, personas, um, those are people who you don't want as a customer. And it's equally as important to have them as the people who are buying. So that might include um, professionals who are too advanced for your product or service, um, or students um, who don't have the, the money to spend um, to buy your products or, or services. Um, and at the most basic level, personas allow you to personalize um, and target your marketing for those different segments of your audience. And that's the whole reason for doing these buyer uh, personas. Um, and for an example, um, just think about if you're sending out some lead nurturing uh, emails. So rather than send out a blanket single email to all your contacts in the database, you can now segment that by buyer persona and send out different types of emails depending on the different people and their different habits. So that's the whole idea behind buyer personas. It's a very, very powerful thing. Um, a lot of companies um, miss out on this. And I think if you miss out on this stage, you don't really understand who your target audience is and you're not maximizing the gain of your marketing potential for that. Okay, so we're talking about leads and we're talking about customers here. Um, and unfortunately, leads just don't, uh, sorry, customers don't just appear out of the blue and they don't uh, uh, generate themselves out of fresh air. If they do for you, please let me know how you do it because it, it certainly doesn't happen for me. Um, so you have to obviously um, try and get some leads first to generate interest and turn website visitors um, into leads, engage with them at some level and then hopefully turn them into uh, paying, paying customers. So let's have a look at what I call the awareness pyramid. So I've shared this uh, this little pyramid with uh, on a couple of Word, WordCamp uh, talks. Um, and generally what it is, is this, this is a representation of all your clients or all your potential clients, right? At the top, you've got 3%. These 3% of people, they are um, aware of a problem they have. Um, they know that there's a solution out there. They know that you have a solution that matches what they're looking for. And they're, they're geared up to buy what, what you're offering. And we call that in buy now mode. It's a very, very limited number of people that have done all the research. They're ready to commit and buy just now. 17%, the one underneath that, um, these are problem aware. So they know a problem exists. Um, and they're actively looking for and researching for a solution to that problem. The group below that, the 20%, they, they're problem aware, but they're not currently searching for a solution or maybe they just don't um, find it urgent enough um, that they're looking for the solution now, but at least they're problem aware. Whereas the big chunk at the bottom, 6% of your potential customers, your potential leads, they have no idea that they do even have a problem out there. Um, so your goal um, as a business person, as a marketer, is to try and move that 97% that isn't in buy now up that pyramid 
um, into that buy now mode. And, and hopefully some of these um, uh, tips that I'm going to be sharing over the next few slides will just help you target those particular different types of um, people in those different segments, those different levels um, of awareness. Auditing your own website. And so now is the ideal time um, to look over your, your business website. Uh, give it a bit of an audit to make sure that you're aligning it with your target audience and their awareness levels um, in the previous uh, pyramid. So I see so many business owners uh, still having on their homepage um, what they do, the products they offer, uh, the services that, that they offer. In reality, nobody really cares about what you do um, and what you offer. They only really care about how it relates to them um, and what problems does it solve. So does it make it, them happier, uh, richer? Um, does it give them more time back? Um, does it uh, relieve their pain or does it relieve their stress? So these are the things that people are searching solutions for. They're not actively looking for a product that you offer. They're looking for something um, that overcomes their issue, that solves their problem. So going back to the awareness pyramid, if I can just, maybe I can go previous one. Here we go. Uh, going back to that one, um, your website should be trying to target people in those particular levels of awareness. So for example, your homepage, if, if you really want to get real quick sales, they could target that 3% at the top to already know that you have a solution and they're willing to buy something. Um, so you can maybe offer them um, their top problem, a solution to their top problem and get them buying through the homepage. Or maybe you wanna target the 37%, so that's the 17 info gathering and the 20% problem aware. Maybe you wanna target them on your homepage um, with articles and facts to um, about your solution, about the problem, about the, the solution that you have around the problem and all the benefits that it gives them to raise them, their awareness up um, to that buying level. Um, so, so rather than have products and services on your homepage, try and think about how you can sell a solution to people's problems in that particular um, awareness. I'll just go to the next one. So have a look through um, your existing landing pages that you have and make sure that they are target audience um, awareness specific. And while you're doing an audit for your website, and you may want to have a look through your old blog posts as well. Um, have a look, see, are they still relevant to who you're trying to sell to? Um, if they're not, consider deleting them. Or if you think you can spin them around, ha have a go rewriting them into a more specific and tailored awareness um, so they're actually engaging um, some of those particular uh, people on that awareness pyramid. So now's a great time just to sit down and do your own self-audit um, of your website. Content marketing, love it. Um, so content marketing, um, it's very simple. It's just a, a simple way of creating valuable and relevant and really focused content. Um, so we're talking about blogs and vlogs and social posts here um, to attract and uh, retain um, your target audience with the ultimate goal of getting them to commit something, to do something in an action. So that could be to sign up um, an email list. Um, it could be for buying a product or service or it could um, uh, give you a contact on the phone or go to your Calendly link, something like that. So content marketing, it's specific writing to make that person perform an action or a goal. And we'll talk about that in, in more focus in a couple of slides. I wanna talk about blogging and, and vlogging. Um, so yes, you can just write articles for fun. Um, it's a good way to increase awareness, your, your brand awareness. It's a good time uh, to add content to your website as well. Um, but that's not content marketing. Content marketing is written for that specific reason other than just to be consumed. It's written for engagement and, and conversion. So it's not just limited to your own website. Um, you can do things like guest posts on external websites. You can do micro vlogging through Instagram TV or TikTok um, or hitting up the stories on Facebook um, and Instagram and also LinkedIn. Uh, so I hear on the grapevine that LinkedIn is gonna have a, a stories section very soon. Um, so yeah, so keep an eye out, out for that one. 
social media. Everyone is on social media just now, primarily because got nothing else to do, it seems like. Um, but you should definitely be adding social media to your list of goodies to attract new clients, absolutely. As well as just regular social posts, um, identify hashtags uh, that resonate with your target audience, uh, ones that they regularly use, and throw in some adjacent ones as well to expand your reach into the awareness pyramid of potential clients. Target social media influencers um, as well, those people in your industry. Um, comment on them. Uh, so when they write articles, comment, thank them for their time uh, to try to befriend them, not, not in a dodgy way, but you know, in, in a good way. Um, share and, and mention them. Um, or write a post um, about how you found uh, their tips was, was great and, and um, yeah, their business uh, knowledge was fantastic and share that with them. Um, because nine out of 10 times, if you write a great article complimenting someone, then they're gonna share that, they're gonna like it and share that with their audience, which gives you a larger reach as well. So for social media, it's really important that you post regularly as well. So maybe you wanna create a timetable for posting and because you really need to keep your followers engaged, otherwise they just, they drop off so quickly. So regular posts for that. So get yourself a social calendar built six months of post topics or types and, and just stick to that for, for six months. Um, another tip is to use trending hashtags as well um, and use items. But as long as they're relevant to what you're trying to sell and what your your, your brand is, don't kind of go completely off topic because your um, you know your, your people are just gonna they're gonna wonder what is it what is it you're doing. Um, yeah so Follow the news, follow the latest items. Obviously the coronavirus is like one of the biggest news items at the moment. Um, and you know, who here hasn't written um, a post about how you work from home during the virus pandemic. So jump on these news items, jump on these, uh, these trending hashtags, see if you can uh, get your post to go out a little bit um, more viral. Landing pages. So this is a type of content marketing. Um, this is um, a laser focused content marketing page, if, if you like. If you don't have a landing page, if you don't have even one landing page on your website just now, um, I do recommend that when you're finished watching this tonight, go and create one. My goodness, you, you really need to have landing pages um, on your website. So a landing page, if you don't, really know what that is. It's, it's a super laser focused page that has one job to do. And it's to get the reader to perform one action. So that could be to subscribe to an email list, uh, pick up a phone and call you, uh, book an appointment in your calendar um, or purchase something. So not two things, not three things, just one action. And that means no header logo link to your homepage. Uh, no navigation bars, so no menus at the top, no footer boxes and no sidebars at all. Just one page that describes a problem, offers a solution, your solution uh, ideally, uh, redresses all objections about price, time, application delivery, uh, reinforces trust, and we're talking about testimonials and customer stories here, and tells the reader what action to perform. And this is, this is real key for a landing page. Um, you can have the best landing page in the world, but if you don't tell people what to do, um, then nine out of 10 times they won't do it. Sometimes people can be like um, uh, monkeys. I don't mean that in a bad way, I'm just saying it like robots. You know, if, if you stop the program, then they won't carry on and do something. They'll just go and read all, elsewhere. So tell them what to do in your landing page. So have things like, click the yes i want this now button below um, things like enter your email below and press submit or push this button to book a free 15 minute chat with with will um, so I, i'll be running an entire uh, landing page webinar next month for the wordpress sydney uh, meetup and um, we're gonna look into what landing pages more detail so hacks about how to create a, a really cracking landing page so so look out for that one uh, next month. Steph, what if your home page is the landing page? Uh, yeah, that's great. Um, usually you'll try and have your home page if that's the highest traffic, then yeah, it makes total sense to try and convert your best customers 
if that's the highest page that you rank. Totally, totally. Um, more often than not, though, your homepage is the gateway into your website. So probably not turn that into a landing page um, if that's where you want people to navigate through your, your site from and if you don't have any navigation anywhere else in your site. So it's up to you. Um, I like to have my landing page to describe to customers how I solve a particular problem, but it's not a laser focused landing page. It's more about educating people into, I understand your problems. I have solutions for that. Why don't you try going here, going there and going there? What I don't do is I don't have, you know, here's my service. You know, I do WordPress, I do consultancy. I do, they don't care about that. You know, I, I try and make them understand I have um, an awareness of their problems and I have solutions that might help them solve their problems. Okay, Steph, I hope that answers your question there. Uh, let's jump on to the next one because I want to try and make this quick tonight because we've already been on for quite a while. Uh, emails. So emails are still the best converting form of marketing you can use to your business. A lot of people might be a bit surprised by that, but, but they are. So when somebody um, subscribes to your mailing list, they are giving you their trust to send emails directly into their inbox. That is solid marketing gold. You, you can't buy that sort of stuff. Um, and according to an opt-in monster survey, here we go, and I can drop that in the comments later on. Uh, let me just read some stats here. Yeah, so um, the opt-in monster survey, and that they did this year, 58% of people will check the email before social media or anything else. So when they wake up, they go to the computer, the first thing they check is email, right? The same survey showed um, that conversion rates of email are 3.71%. A conversion is somebody performing an action that that email has been um, um, asking them to do. So 3.71% of people will, will, will do that thing from an open rate of 22.86%. And that's against an overall conversion rate of only 0.58%, so half a percent for the socials. So Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So what's that? what that is saying is that when you send out an email, you're probably gonna get about a 20, 25% um, open rate. And off that open rate, three and a half to four percent of people are clicking on the link in that email and doing wherever it is you want them to go to, compared to just half a percent of the social media if you're running an ad or, or articles. <clears throat> and that's awesome. That's like six times um, the percent uh, just using email marketing. So that, that's, that's really good news. So email marketing works. And if you haven't started collecting people's emails, if you haven't started an email list, then start one today right after you get your landing page finished because it's really, really powerful stuff and it works. So before we leave the topic of emails, um, I want to talk about email automation, not, not do a deep dive, but just kind of put it on your plate for people who maybe haven't heard about this sort of thing. So um, email marketing, what it isn't, it isn't you sitting there writing tons of emails every day. Um, it's all about writing um, emails that link into sales funnels and campaigns. So you'd write one email um, and it, and then you link that into a campaign or a funnel. Um, and when it sends out, it sends out via a trigger, um, a, some sort of rule. And that rule could be somebody subscribed to your email list, it sends out an email, a welcome email. Um, somebody has abandoned your cart and they haven't purchased something. So you send them an email to say, oh, you know, um, I see you haven't bought this thing. You know, here's some reasons why you really should. Um, or it could be if someone signs up for a webinar or an online course. Um, so um, email automation, um, that's it. I don't want to delve into specifics. I just want to put it onto your radar just in case some people out there haven't heard about it or are maybe thinking about thinking that email marketing is all about just sitting on your computer and writing up tons and tons of emails. So it's, it, it's not that. And we'll maybe cover email automation maybe in another online webinar at, at some point. Testimonials, <clears throat> my goodness. Testimonials are so important and it builds trust and authority. So when was the last time you asked your family, members um, or friends um, who the last plumber was and if they did a good job? So it's, it's word of mouth, it's trust. 
or if you're a business person, when was the last time you asked somebody who audited your website or who looked after your WordPress website? So you want people to tell you, you know, what a good job other people have done because it builds trust and authority. So testimonials um, are great for that. And you should definitely start collecting them. So ask your previous clients um, or your and your current clients as well um, and give them a Google review page or a LinkedIn review link so they can leave a review, some feedback for you. Or, or just send them a Google form or just ask them an email to send a few paragraphs um, that they can send to you. So you can embed that on your website. You can embed embed that on your content marketing, you can embed that on your landing pages. So you can use these testimonials anywhere. Um, and when you do, people are more likely to engage with you and your brand um, if others have already given you a, a, a thumbs up. So definitely start building the client testimonials and reviews. Um, I'd say go even further, I'd say build it into your, your process. Um, so as part of your project, uh, for example, your post project process, when you're, you're doing handover and stuff, um, at that point, we ask them for feedback and send them some links. Um, so client testimonials, they, they are super important. Right, Belinda, Google reviews have been switched off. Yes, it is absolutely annoying for that just now. Um, obviously people, it's been switched off because of the virus, because people are not going into shops and things, because uh, Google reviews, it's all kind of based around uh, local businesses. Uh, yep, um, but you know, there's heaps of other ways to collect it. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the, the next best alternative. Um, so ask them to connect with you on LinkedIn and leave a review, or just simply have, have a Google form and, and, and send about. After you've had a chat with them, don't just send it blind. Um, to say, you know, that it's awesome working with you. I'd love to know how you felt working with me. Um, could you spend two minutes filling out a, a Google form? Um, that'd be fantastic. Okay, let's move on and wrap this up. Not, not many more to go. Um, so webinars, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, webinars and free courses. Yes, you can do these and you should if you have the time, uh, but make sure they are high quality content and targeted for your target audience. So don't just create courses and webinars just for, for the fun of it. Oh, you can if you've got spare time. Um, but we're talking about business here. Um, so make sure they're targeted um, for your audience. Now, sure, they can be time consuming uh, to prepare, which is why I think you should probably think about creating evergreen content. So that's content that's relevant all the time um, to people at a certain level of that awareness pyramid. Uh, so people might might change, they might move up and down uh, that pyramid, hopefully go up, um, and that content won't be relevant to them. But then other people who are still in that level, they can consume that evergreen content again and again and again. So try not to link your content um, to uh, timeline-specific things, um, unless you think you can make good money for that. Evergreen content is the way to go. <coughs> You can also ask attendees, totally ask attendees for an email address so they can access your webinar and free course. In fact, you probably should be doing that. Um, and then of course you can use that list. You can lose, use those emails as part of a larger marketing campaign um, to try and push your paid services and products. That's totally fine, totally acceptable. Um, the free courses and webinars, uh, they don't need to be epic. They just need to be really good quality and relevant information. So they don't need to go on for 10 days. You know, they can be short, um, two, two hour, one hour courses, as long as they're, they're providing real high quality content for your target audience. Steph, you read my mind. Um, the next one is, is paid advertising. Um, so yes. Um, so I love this picture, by the way. I'm sorry, I, I, I was looking for stock pictures and I came across this one. I thought this was just fantastic. So I had to use it. It doesn't have anything to do with paid advertising, but I thought it was, was a fantastic picture. And so paid ads, yes, you should give this a go, um, but keep within a budget. Of course, you don't wanna um, be spending heaps of money if it's not working. And make sure that you're aligning the advertising platform up with the target audience's intent. Um, so what I mean by that um, is use Google Ads for people who are towards the top of that awareness pyramid. So people who are already problem aware um, and already know that solution is out there or is looking for a solution. 
And because when people are Googling, they're usually Googling for things like comparisons, things like solutions, how do I, and what does, things like that. <clears throat> so those are your ideal customers to try and target through, through PPC and from Google. So, um, use Facebook and the socials uh, to target um, those people who are kind of lower down in that awareness pyramid. So people who are maybe problem aware but are, don't think it's urgent or people have no idea that they, they could potentially have, have this problem. Because when people are on the socials, they're usually not looking intently for something specific. They're just kind of browsing around, connecting with friends. So you, you, what you don't want to be doing there is wasting your um, your money on aggressive PPC ads um, to point them to buy now um, landing pages because they're probably not in that buy now mode. So definitely push them towards pages that describe a problem um, that they have and which hint at um, a mention of a solution that you could have for them to try and engage them, move them along that chain and push them up, up that pyramid. So at, at, in, in general, um, the social media platforms um, are generally going to be B2C or business to consumer. So I'm a business, I am selling to a consumer. Whereas LinkedIn, if you're looking at LinkedIn ads, maybe running some of those, they're going to be more generally B2B or business to business. So depending on where your target audience is, you might just want to have a think about where you're going to be spending your, your ad spend, your ad spend on. Just the last thing on ads is if you're thinking about ads, that should probably be one of the last things that you do after you've implemented all this stuff that I've kind of went through through tonight. Um, so you need to have your, your stuff set up first um, in order to like create your ads to send them to parts of, of your, your campaign. And talking about campaign, this is the last slide I have, which you'll be you'll be glad to know. Last few slides. Um, let's talk about sales funnel, and this is really where we've been heading to. It's a culmination of, of this presentation here. It's, it's when we put all these steps together um, and make them work for us. Um, so let's say we've used all that we've previously discussed um, to create a sales funnel. This is the step process um, where we get the potential leads to engage with us to push them up that pyramid into buy mode. Um, it may take weeks um, or months, um, but once you have this in place, um, it can run on autopilot. You know, of course, you don't want to just sit and leave it all the time. You do need to want to go back to your sales funnels and tweak them and just make sure that they're targeting um, the right people. Um, but really, this is probably the ultimate goal that you want to be going for. This is like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Not really, but it kind of it can feel like that. When, when they actually start to work. And of course, don't just have one sales funnel, have lots of sales funnel targeting different segments, different um, buyer personas, uh, different people as well. So I just wanna run through just, just a few typical sales funnels just to give you an idea of, of, of what I mean. So here's one for organic keywords. So this is people searching um, on Google. In this example, um, they're searching for, for school-related stuff. So T-shirts, um, school band T-shirts, school play T-shirts. And each one of those um, is going to take them to a very specific laser-focused landing page that's going to ask them to do something. And in this instance here, um, we're going to ask them to opt in um, to a form. And once that form is completed, um, it just says it's my thank you page, and it maybe allows them to download something as an incentive, an, an incentive um, to get them to put their details in and, and leave them with you. But you can see off to the side in the, in the pink or, or purple um, that now they've got this uh, name added to an email list. We now have a follow-up sequence. Um, this is part of your funnel. They just keep sending them emails um, and, and until they, they start to order um, the thing that you're trying to get them to do in that sales funnel. So that's an example of an organic um, keyword funnel. Here's some quick examples of e-commerce ones as well. Um, the first one here again is an organic search and it's doing the same thing. It's, it's dripping you um, down into um, content marketing articles um, and landing pages. Uh, the lead magnet, that would be the, the download, the white paper, the PDF, the I'm gonna send you some groovy tips and give me your email. And then again, once you're on the email there, you're gonna send out, gonna drip feed relevant content with the whole intent of them to um, buy what it is that you want them to buy. The second one is an example of ads. Um, here we've got some Facebook, Instagram, and Google ads here. 
um, exactly the same thing. The ads are pointing to landing pages um, or, or, or lead nurturing pages. Um, again, with the intent to buy something. Um, but these ones, this one here has an abandoned cart funnel on it. So you've led someone to the cart. Um, they haven't uh, bought it. So you want to follow up with them. You want to retarget them and just send some emails out to kind of gently see if you can push them towards um, buying that thing again, redress their objections that they might have had and, and just get them to, to make a purchase. <clears throat> um, and the third example here, very similar, but it's just that people who are searching on social media and then cover your content, not your ads, your content. Again, it's a similar thing, um, pushing them through to, uh, um, to infographics, to blog art articles, to landing pages, and just retargeting them if they don't pick up on, on that particular action. Last one here is uh, email sales. Um, so just here's a, a sales funnel. It's built just primarily just for email. So once you've once you've grabbed an email, um, what sort of things can you do with that? So it's a thank you page. There's then um, a one time offer. You know, uh, buy this thing now, or you know, if you get rid of this screen, it'll go forever, or well, the price will increase. Um, there's a welcome email with a download link as well. That's your incentive, and um, putting people onto. Um, um, again, an email list that you can then send out offers and freebie stuff. Again, just warming them up, pushing them up the pyramid. Um, and again, at the very bottom here, now that you've got your customer list, um, you know, in the weeks, in the months ahead, you're going to start sending them all these um, information, this uh, this good information, good quality content, um, and reminding them again that you have um, um, a solution to that particular problem that they have and would like to to go ahead and purchase that or get some more information out for it. So there's some kind of typical, very, very simple funnels um, that you can think about. Um, I just give it, get your idea um, about how you can maybe implement some of those um, using those steps that we've went through here tonight. Uh, Steph, what do you recommend for email funnel software, MailChimp? Um, okay, yeah, so, um, so we're talking about once people have um, opted in and have, you've added um, them to your email list, what can you do with that? There's heaps of uh, different uh, services out there. Uh, MailChimp is quite a popular one to start off with because they have this free tier. Um, so they can send um, something like 2,000 emails a month, I think it is, um, and, as, and they put their branding on the bottom of the email. So you, you, can't, you can't get rid of that. That's why it's free. MailChimp is good, um, but I think when you start using it for business, uh, you want to start creating lots of lists, lots of segments, um, lots of automation. And that's where MailChimp, the free version, kind of uh, falls down. You have to start paying for the pro version, which isn't a bad thing paying, but I think it lacks a lot of the automation, a lot of the features that some of the other um, bigger players uh, use. So there's other systems called Drip, um, which is huge. Um, I use Active Campaign, uh, and I'm very happy with that. They've got like a visual builder for automation, um, Drip does. Uh, have that as well and they've also got really good uh, integration as well with with wordpress um oh my goodness is that the first time we've talked about wordpress tonight could be um yeah um so yeah there's heaps of stuff out there um really it depends what works for you and what you want to do with it and how you want to integrate it um yeah so hopefully that answered your your question steph um that's it that's all the topics that we talked about today um very very brief overview of all of those um, we might go into a little bit more detail in some follow-up webinars uh, for each of these specific ones. Um, the landing page one being next month, where we will go into those, those details. That's me. I'm happy for you guys to connect with me. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Twitter as well. Um, if you're going to connect with me on LinkedIn, um, my, my profile name is Developer Will, please, please leave a, a message or notification. Don't just go connect because I get heaps of connects and it doesn't have a little message I feel a bit bummed that people are just won't, won't talk to me so yeah leave a little message and just say you know um, I heard you on a WordPress meetup um, webinar last night and we'd like to, to connect and yeah happy happy to do that um, yeah so that's all I wanted to go through tonight let's just get rid of this and get James back on screen um, Thank if you have any particular questions about that stuff, then happy to answer that here. Um, if not, then we'll just do like a general Q&A. What time is it? It's quarter to eight. So if we can just maybe 
yeah, do general Q and A WordPress stuff. Anything's been brought up tonight, except for Brooke because she's away now. <laughs> Um, but we can try and answer those. Um, then, yeah, just put stuff in the comments below. We'll give you guys a few minutes to to put some things in in there, and we can answer any WordPress or marketing content type stuff. Any questions? Anything at all? WordPress related. <laughs> I put in the comments a um, good mail program at the moment is Send in Blue. Have you heard of it before, Will? Send in blue. Yeah. No. So that was your comment here. Yeah. No, I've not heard of that one. They're actually really good. A client a client showed it to me and I was like, oh, this is this is actually pretty good. Um they do they kind of pick all the portfolios of all the other ones. So they have an unlimited plan. You can have as many contacts as you want. They just limit how much you can send. So it's a lot better for like startups and small businesses because they can have maybe 5,000 contacts and then you can send a campaign out but they limit it to 400 people a day so it, it might take <coughs> three days to send a campaign but that's still better than having to pay for regular yeah I, I do like um, active campaign is similar um, so you get, you get all the tools once you pay for the plan yeah very expensive. but then they're a little bit expensive, but their automation tools are absolutely um, fantastic. I've, I've really good. Um, but I've noticed as well, um, like like Drip, they're meant to be the e-commerce CRM mail thing, but um, like the Mailchimp WooCommerce integration just doesn't work at all. I don't know if you've tried to get it to work, but it just the plugin uh, is the Mailchimp yes. WooCommerce plugin. Oh yes, um, yeah, I tried getting that work. To work oh, yeah. uh, maybe about five six years ago and i actually fixed it and i sent it to the developers and they did absolutely nothing at all yeah, with it so it's still the same. It's still the yeah same. i just abandoned that so i actually use for most of my um email marketing um i tend to use zapier to link yeah. in because it does a lot more stuff so for example in active campaign they have uh they have a plugin which is good but all the plugin allows you to do is add people onto the list yeah. Whereas with Zapier, sorry, well. the the active campaign plugin does cart abandonment. Oh yeah, it does that, but it, it doesn't do tagging. That's what I was want oh. to say. So, um, so I use Zapier um, with active campaign, and it allows you to tag people on the different processes. Um, so, for example, if they're buying something, I can tag them with the product name or the service name, so I know exactly what they've bought. Um, which you can't do with the WordPress plugin. It's just a simple add to an email list. The um, the send in blue one sends all the data, the WooCommerce data to send in blue, and then you can like you can say if someone bought this plugin, uh, if someone bought this product, do this, send this email, send them this text message, show them this Facebook ad, buy the upsell or whatever, you know, retarget them. Yeah. So we have a question from Paul. He says, any thoughts on Zoho Mail? Uh, James, you're, you're the authority on email and CRM because you tried everyone on the planet. I don't use Zoho. I actually <laughs> didn't use it for one old domain that I have that I don't want to pay anything for. Um, it's, it's good. Um, the only problem, I don't know if this question is relating to like a free plan or not, um, but the only problem um, that I would say is that their free plan, which, you know, I wouldn't pay Zoho to use it. I'd rather go with, like, G Suite, I think. But um, their free plan doesn't have any IMAP capabilities. So you can only use their web browser or their iPhone or Android app. You can't add it to the mail app on your phone or the or Outlook on your computer or Mac mail on your computer. Okay. So, but it's great as a free option to start out. So, yeah, yeah. I would pay for it. Okay. Thanks. I've not used it, so I can't comment. Gregory, how easy do you find it is to context switch between development tasks and sales and marketing efforts? <laughs> uh, how do I answer that one? I guess I've gotten easier over time. I think it's something that just comes with uh, maturity in business and exactly how you prioritize things as well. 
Uh, when you work for yourself, when you're a freelancer, you've got your own business, you kind of, well, unless you've got the money to pay other people to do it, which you, you should probably think about doing some things, siphon them off, yet you generally become like a, you've got all these different hats on. Um, I don't find it any particular problem with doing that. I've got very specific days and hours of the days of the week that I spend time doing these things. Um, I think the biggest effort comes as setting up in the first place. So not having the processes in place, not having these things set up, it's going to take you a lot of time to do that. But once you get that done, um, I think if you have a good solid process, a good solid workflow uh, for the week, for the month, then yeah, you just definitely allocate a little bit of time and just stay on top of it. So yeah, that's a great question, Gregory. You're organized. I just do things when they come <laughs> when they come by. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one from Belinda. Using WooCommerce and Mailchimp integration for client site and working fine. Oh, great! That's You're super probably good the only team. person that it works for. <laughs> <laughs> like, have you seen their plugin? The the plugin um, the comments on the Woo, on the WordPress repository for the plugin. It's got like hundreds of one star reviews and like three five star reviews i don't i don't know I don't understand but yeah <laughs> steph thanks for all the questions tonight buddy um how would you split your time across web design external marketing ppc and blogging etc um I th for me i think you just need to allocate the ones that are important to you and and get them done well when you've when you've got lots of clients, when you've got lots of types of different businesses, I think the key is to try and siphon off some of the tasks that you do and give them to like a virtual assistant or somebody who's really good at that task. So I used to, I used to do um, all my admin stuff, um, accounts and things, and put in um, invoices and stuff myself. Uh, nah, I pay somebody to do that now. I just take a photo and send it to them, and they do that. So that that kind of I was going to say boring, but that essential stuff um, that you do, you just try and siphon as much of that that off to to paid people. Uh, <clears throat> Marketing is the same. You know, if you can afford to pay somebody to help you, um, so things like um, things like setting up email funnels, uh, marketing funnels, you've got the knowledge in your head, but if you've got a process that tells people how you want it set up. So, example, you need to go into Active Campaign, um, <clears throat> go and you know set up this type of uh, funnel with these types of triggers. Then maybe you shouldn't be the best person doing that. Maybe you should be hiring somebody to uh, to do that process. So yeah, you give them the knowledge, but then let them do their funky stuff because they're all Active Campaign, you know, gurus. Um, so yeah, splitting your time it's difficult. Um, it's really up to you and where you see the important stuff is. But I would definitely say to everyone, maybe think about um, what sort of stuff you can offload to other people. Um, obviously, you need to balance that with how much money is coming in, so you have to pay somebody um, to do that. But it definitely frees up time for you to do more important stuff as well. Any other questions from anyone? Otherwise, I think we might call it a night. Almost eight o'clock anyway. Yeah, no, it's good. Okay, well, thanks very much, everyone, for for joining in. Um, it's really good. Uh, give thanks to Brooke for her presentation uh, tonight, and we give thanks to you guys for all the the awesome questions and being there for us. Um, so please keep an eye on our meetup page. Um, we will post the slide links, um, and uh, will this video will be available for replay once. Uh, YouTube uh, processes it and gets it up there. Oh, one last question from Belinda. Oh, that one. What do you suggest when a new client is already to go ahead verbally, said they're going ahead, timeless discussed, and they last minute decide to go elsewhere? James, do you want to answer that one first? Call them 50,000 times until no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I mean, there's not a whole lot you can do if they. <clears throat> Um, decide to go elsewhere and they've, they've gone. Um, I mean, I'd look back at what, what your process was. Maybe maybe your process could be improved um, and 
um, like instead of verbally saying they're going ahead, get it in writing, you know, um, try and try and get them to commit a bit sooner um, rather than um, just verbally saying it. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, um, I think if someone's decided to go elsewhere um, and that's that, it would be great if uh, you could contact them and ask them why. Just, yeah. just ask them, just say, you know, you know, I'm really sad to see you go. Um, you know, I really uh, would welcome some feedback as to why uh, you went with this other place uh, rather than me. I'm not trying to do a sales pitch, I just like to know how to how I can improve my process for, for next time. Because that's a valuable bit of information. That's what you need to know is this why they went elsewhere. So that as James says, next time you can include that into your process and hopefully uh, not get tripped up on, on that point. Yeah. You never uh, know yeah, what great question. come back if you even ask them for feedback. Yeah, you, yeah, absolutely. Because it, it shows that you've, you know, you've handled it professionally. And then let's say they've gone elsewhere and had a bad experience, they'll probably come back to you. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, guys, that's a wrap for tonight. Um, keep an eye on the Meetup site as well. Next month's big one is going to be on landing pages. Um, but we might do like little micro webinars during the month as well, just on some of the smaller topics if we, if James and I have some time on our hands. Um, yeah, so that's great. Anything, any final words, James? That's it for me. Thanks, everyone, for coming. That's it. Yep, okay, that's a wrap. Bye. Bye.